Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to see you all here. Uh, my name is Janne Nijman. I'm the academic director of the uh, Asser Institute. Welcome, warm welcome to this uh, last uh, supranational criminal law lecture of the year, 2015. Um, as you know, the, uh, C the SCL lecture series is a lecture series on international criminal law that has been organized since 2003 um, in collaboration uh, by the Asser Institute, in collaboration um, uh, with the coalition of the ICC and Grotius Center for International Legal Studies of Leiden University. Now tonight, I'm a bit hesitant whether should wait a bit more? No, the others will come. Tonight we uh, are very proud, uh, I must say, to have Professor Sean uh, Murphy here amidst uh, us, in our midst, um, to talk about um, the, uh, the, the work of the International Law Commission on Crimes Against Humanity. Now, Professor Murphy is a member of the United Nations International Law Commission, serving as Special Rapporteur for the topic of Crimes Against Humanity, and is the Patricia Roberts Harris Research Professor of Law at uh, George Washington University in Washington. Uh, Professor Murphy teaches public international law and United States foreign relations law, and has previously taught international organizations, law of the sea, international environmental law, and many more courses. Now, it's interesting to mention also all your work in legal practice, and especially from July 1995 to July 1998, Professor Murphy served as the legal counselor of the U.S. Embassy here in The Hague, and in that capacity you represented the U.S. government before the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and even other tribunals well. So we're really happy to have you and um, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you Jane very much for that very warm and kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me to come to the Asser Institute. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be talking a bit about the International Law Commission and particularly the topic of crimes against humanity that we're currently uh, working on. Um, so let me begin by just saying a little bit about the Commission generally. I imagine most people in the room are aware of what it is, but maybe just say a few words about, uh, about it. Uh, when people ask me what is the International Law Commission, I often describe it as the legal think tank of the United Nations, right? So the basic idea was early on uh, in the life of the United Nations, let's create a place where work could be done on codifying uh, and progressively developing international law. And so not too long after the creation of the United Nations itself, uh, the General Assembly created the International Law Commission, adopted a statute which regulates our activity and interestingly, early on, the thought was that there were areas of international law that were uh, well settled and could be easily codified, and that that might just be done through instruments that weren't ultimately turned into treaties, that it could just be statements of the law or restatements of the law. And then separately, there might be areas of international law that required progressive development, and if you were going to do progressive development, the expectation was more that this would be done in the form of a treaty uh, that states would join, and that's uh, proper because states wouldn't be bound until they've actually ratified the treaty, uh, and in areas where the law is being progressively developed, that's appropriate. As it's turned out, the International Law Commission has never operated on the basis that things are quite that distinct, uh, that in pretty much all areas of international law, there's going to be some amount of settled law and some areas where the law is not so clear and therefore you have to fill in a gap and progressively develop. And so right from the start, it didn't really approach its projects with that dichotomy. 
And that instead meant that we were doing a little bit of both in all of our projects, uh, oftentimes concluding in draft articles that would then become a treaty instrument. And so, of course, as I'm sure you know, many of the main instruments of international law, Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, uh, the Rome Statute in its original form was drafted at the International Law Commission, uh, the recent convention on the jurisdictional immunities of states and their property, also uh, done at the International Law Commission. So we've had a, a, a rather lengthy and I think robust history in developing some of the key areas of international law. Right now we have roughly 10 topics on our agenda and I won't go through all of them, but I will mention a couple. One of them is the topic on protection of persons in the event of disasters. So when a disaster strikes, natural or man-made, think a tsunami hits a country and it causes tremendous damage to that country and relo forces a relocation of people and maybe even causes infrastructure breakdown that in turn causes difficulties. You know, what are the rights and obligations of states in a situation like that? Do states outside the place where the disaster occurred have a right to offer assistance? Uh, if they do that, how should they do it? Um, if the host state wants to refuse that assistance, can it do that uh, on whatever basis, or does it have to have some reasonable or non-arbitrary reaction to the, uh, the request to, to provide assistance. Things like that are being captured in that project. I mention it because we are finishing, we think, that project next summer. So we will be doing a final reading, we call it, of the project, and at that point it will be sent forward to the UN General Assembly, and governments can decide whether they want to pick it up and pursue a global treaty on that, or just leave it for a while and see what happens. Maybe some states on a regional context use it for some purpose. Maybe even states in a sub-regional or in a national context might use uh, articles of that kind. I'll mention one other project before I talk about crimes against humanity, and that is a project we have on identification of customary international law. Sometimes people find it unusual that the Commission, 60 years after its creation, is only now getting around to talking about the rules on identification of customary international law, but in fact, it is the case that we just picked this topic up about three years ago, three or four years ago, and are in the process of developing conclusions on identification of customary international law along with commentary. Um, we expect next summer hopefully by the end of the summer, to have a full set of those conclusions with commentary approved by the Commission on first reading, and then typically we would wait at least a year, more commonly two years, uh, to do the second reading. So there'll be a period of another couple of years before we finalize that project, um, and if you have questions about that project, uh, the special rapporteur for it, Sir Michael Wood, is in the room and can be uh, probed as you wish unless he sneaks out before you attempt to do so. Um, so let me turn now to uh, the topic of uh, crimes against humanity, and maybe I'll do this by giving a window on how a topic gets adopted at the International Law Commission. What, what does it take to put a topic on the agenda and how does it then move forward? Because I think the Crimes Against Humanity Project um, is a good example of this because it's happening right now. And so when I was uh, nominated by the U.S. government to stand for election to the International Law Commission, uh, I had to campaign. And I met with about 97 countries one-on-one -on -one to try to get their vote uh, because it's all fine and good for the U.S. government to nominate me, but at the end of the day, you have to be elected in the General Assembly, and typically these are contested elections, so any candidate can lose, and so you have to go out and, and solicit votes. 
And oftentimes in the meetings that I had with governments, uh, I would be asked questions such as, how do you think the commission could be improved? Or do you think the commission is working on the right topics? Or if you had an opportunity to put a topic on the agenda of the commission, what would it be? And particularly that last question got me thinking about, well, if I did have the opportunity to put a topic on the agenda, what should it be? And as I looked around at different areas of international law, I came upon this idea that maybe the area of crimes against humanity had a gap. Uh, the gap being that we do have a convention on genocide, right? Genocide convention. We do have treaties speaking to war crimes, particularly the 1949 Geneva Conventions. We don't have a treaty on crimes against humanity specifically focused on that crime and on various things that might relate to that crime. So, for example, an obligation upon a state to adopt a national statute uh, criminalizing crimes against humanity, an obligation upon a state to exercise jurisdiction over persons who commit crimes against humanity, things of that sort. Uh, so, uh, having sort of spotted that there was this gap out there, uh, which was not unique to me, there were people years before me who were saying this, uh, going back to the 1990s and, and even earlier, but having, having seen that gap and having thought about whether it might be part of a next generation of treaties dealing with international humanitarian law, international criminal law, and so on. Um, and having seen that, of course, crimes against humanity are an unfortunate phenomenon uh, in the world today. And you can think of a lot of different countries where we worry about the fact that it seems like there are crimes against humanity being committed that need to somehow be addressed. Uh, having thought of all of those things, uh, I decided to propose to the Commission that it take up the topic of crimes against humanity. And the way that works is you place a proposal before a particular group, the long-term planning group at the uh, Commission. We operate the meetings of that group in a very closed uh, system. We, it's just the members of the Commission. There's no <coughs> research assistants or others sort of percolating around, and that allows us to be very candid with each other as to whether we think a particular topic is a good one or a bad one. And I would say in my time there, most topics have not gone forward that are proposed. Most of them get shot down for one reason or another. Um, my topic, Crimes Against Humanity, we talked about for two full summers, 2012 and 2013, in a series of meetings of that group uh, asking a lot of hard questions about is it really a topic that should be pursued, why, and what form, what's the purpose, is it likely governments would be interested in this, does it conflict with other things, lots of issues that had to be uh, wrestled with. And let me mention just one issue that came up, uh, and that was, well, how does this relate to the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court? That's a pretty obvious question to, to raise. Indeed, some people, when I've started to talk to them about this, say, well, we've got the Rome Statute. Why would we need something like this? And the answer I gave, and I think ultimately this is something that the Commission also generally feels, is that the Rome Statute creates a particular institution, the International Criminal Court, based here in The Hague, and it speaks a lot about that institution the way it should operate, the, the crimes within its jurisdiction, the, the method by which prosecutors should move forward with investigations and prosecutions, the structure of the judges and the, the registry and so on. And it speaks somewhat to the relationship of the ICC to member states. In particular, if the ICC asks for surrender of a uh, alleged offender, you must, as a state party, hand that person over. So it talks about that vertical relationship between the ICC and the member states, but there's nothing in the Rome Statute that's talking about the horizontal relationship among states, right? 
And so to the extent you're interested in things like extradition between states on something like crimes against humanity or mutual legal assistance, there's nothing in the Rome Statute that expressly deals with those kinds of issues. And so the answer, I think, is if you're interested in focusing on the issue of national prosecutions, national prosecutions, building up that national capacity to indict offenders that are in your territory, to allow states to be talking to each other about mutual legal assistance and, and extradition and so on, perhaps even to have an interstate dispute settlement process, right? So think about the Genocide Convention. There's an ability of a country like Bosnia to bring a country like Serbia before the ICJ on the basis of the Genocide Convention. And of course, those cases are limited to claims that you're not uh, properly applying the Genocide Convention or adhering to the Genocide Convention, well, maybe we should have something similar to that for crimes against humanity, thereby allowing states to uh, bring cases against each other in that particular uh, area. So that was the basic idea. It did catch on within this long-term planning group at the International Law Commission. Um, that meant it was placed on our long-term work program. And when we do that, we wait a year. This is a very long process, but we wait another year to see what governments say in New York in the fall when the legal committee of the General Assembly, the sixth committee, meets to debate the work of the ILC. And so in the fall of 2013, we're listening to or reading about the views taken by governments about the possibility of the ILC taking up this topic. And by and large, the views were favorable or at least neutral about the topic. Some governments aren't <coughs> entirely sure what this will entail. They're not opposed to it, but they're not wildly enthusiastic because they're still not clear on exactly what uh, the end product will be. In any event, the uh, reviews uh, given by governments were strong enough that the Commission decided in the summer of 2014 to go forward with the project. That meant putting it on our active agenda and it meant appointing a special rapporteur and that ended up being me, which was a good thing because it was my original idea. Uh, you don't have to pick the person who brings the topic to the Commission as the special rapporteur, but uh, assuming there's no reasons not to, that often would be the case. Um, so we put it on the active agenda in 2014. At that point, I had a mandate to go forward in developing the project um, to try to help guide and assist the commission. So I wrote a first report on crimes against humanity that was uh, produced at the United Nations in February of this year. So if you're interested in seeing the first report on crimes against humanity, you go to the International Law Commission's website, you click on analytical guide, it'll allow you to go then to the crimes against humanity page, and there one of the few items you'll see is my first report. Having written the first report in the spring of this year, what happens is we show up this past summer in Geneva and we debate that report for a week in May. During that debate, out of the 34 members of the International Law Commission, 25 spoke up, which is a pretty solid number of people interested in the project and interested in making statements about what they liked or didn't like in my report. Um, based on those reactions, the Commission decided that they did want to send to our drafting committee the draft articles that I had proposed. So the next week we go into the drafting committee and we spend a week there working and reworking the text that I had proposed for draft articles. And at the end of that process, out pops four draft articles on a possible convention for the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. So let me indicate what those basic draft articles are because uh, at the end of the summer the Commission as a whole 
adopts the draft articles with commentary to them. And so if you're interested in seeing what's the latest at the ILC on this project, you want to go to the 2015 annual report and you want to look at chapter seven because there you'll find all four of these draft articles plus the, uh, the commentary. The first draft article is just a scope article. It basically says this, uh, these draft articles deal with the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. That's signaling that this project is interested in both of those issues, prevention and punishment. This is a little bit of a, an additional way in which it's different from the Rome Statute because the Rome Statute's really focused more on the punishment side of things, not so much on the prevention unless you view punishment as a deterrent that will help prevent, which I think it is. But uh, prevention is a concept that is in uh, instruments like the Genocide Convention, which is called the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. And prevention is a different idea. The idea there is it's going to impose obligations on states to take steps to prevent crimes against humanity, and I'll come back to that in a minute. This project is going to deal with both prevention and punishment. Draft Article 2 contains a general obligation upon states to prevent and punish. It's a chapeau, maybe that's the wrong term, but it's a sort of threshold article that is going to then be developed through the remaining articles in the uh, this particular uh, project. And um, in speaking about it as a general obligation, it recognizes that crimes against humanity are a crime under international law and then calls upon states to prevent and, and punish that uh, crime. It uses language very similar to the Genocide Convention, and um, that language um, is useful because I think that ultimately the uh, jurisprudence that surrounds anything relating to the Genocide Convention, as well as scholarship perhaps, will have some carryover effect to this project. The two are, are to a certain extent um, in alignment. There's a third draft article on the definition of crimes against humanity, definition. And here the commission was quite clear from the start that although one could imagine ways of altering, perhaps improving, the definition contained in the Rome Statute, there was no interest in trying to do that. Uh, there was instead a very strong interest in taking Article 7 of the Rome Statute and basically super copying it into the International Law Commission's project. One reason for that is it was a hard-fought definition at the Rome conference and in the preparatory meetings leading up to the Rome conference, there were different equities at stake. That is the definition that came out of it. And that's a definition that now 120 plus states have signed up to. So there appears to be fairly strong uh, political support among states for that particular definition. Um, moreover, the idea in the project in part is to help uh, promote or operate within the complementarity system, right? So the idea in the project is if we're serious about complementarity, we're serious about the idea of states in the first instance within their national systems going after people for these crimes and only if they're unable or unwilling might it end up going to the ICC in The Hague. So if that's right, you want to have a definition of crimes against humanity that's operating at the national level that is in harmony with the definition operating at the ICC because that will make the complementarity system more uh, seamless. So the definition has that. Now I said we basically super copied. There are some what I regard as non-substantive changes that we had to make. So for example, the Rome Statute Article 7 says in one or two places for purposes of this statute, and since we're not writing a statute, we have to say for purposes of these draft articles, and then whenever it becomes a convention, it would be for purposes of this convention. Those kinds of changes we had to make, but basically we're keeping the definition. One further interesting element is that we did add a fourth paragraph 
to the definition, which basically says nothing in this definition should be construed as affecting other definitions that exist in other instruments or in national legal systems that are broader in scope, basically I'm paraphrasing. But the idea there is there might be situations where a national statute uh, has even a broader definition of crimes against humanity and it wasn't our intention to try to displace that or cast aspersions on it. And there certainly are some international instruments that have a different definition of crimes against humanity. Here I'm thinking of the Convention on Enforced Disappearances, for example, has a different definition than crimes against humanity and we wanted to avoid creating any sort of implication that our project was meant to in any way affect those types of instruments. And if you joined a treaty that came out of the ILC's project, you aren't in some fashion rejecting, setting aside, altering, you know, any other uh, type of definition. Uh, having said all of that, if you have a national law that's broader than the definition that is in our project, for uh, matters that fall outside the definition of our project, it won't be within the scope of our convention. So you will have some difficulty doing things like extradition and mutual legal assistance on those parts of your definition that are broader than our definition. Draft Article 4 is on prevention, prevention of crimes against humanity. And here we've written it in a way that to a certain extent tracks the Genocide Convention, to a certain extent adds more into it, drawing upon things like the Torture Convention. But I would say there's four basic elements in this prevention draft article. Element number one is the idea that a state itself, through its organs or through persons that it has effective control over, cannot commit crimes against humanity. It must prevent those actions from happening. This has a state responsibility aspect to it. It's basically saying if you commit these crimes yourself, uh, or if people under your control commit these crimes, it will trigger state responsibility. That is the way the Genocide Convention works. That's the basis upon which the claims were brought by Bosnia and Croatia and so on. So there's that element. There's a second element, which I would say is maybe a little bit more forward-leaning or controversial element, and that is persons or entities or states not under your control but over whom you have some amount of influence, you must try to exercise that influence so as to prevent them from committing crimes against humanity. Here, the Commission is trying to adhere very closely to the jurisprudence that came out of the Bosnia v. Serbia case, where the ICJ says, look, Serbia didn't have uh, effective control over the uh, persons uh, doing the bad acts in Srebrenica. Nevertheless, it did because of its historical relationship, geographic relationship, political relationship with uh, Bosnia Srpska, it had an ability to influence those persons not to commit genocide, and it failed to exercise that influence. And so in situations like that, this obligation to prevent also gets some traction, right? Now that's a little bit more forward-leaning, a little bit more controversial because it does raise questions, well, how, you know, when exactly is it that you might or might not have influence? Um, and, you know, the idea here isn't to trigger an obligation upon all states worldwide to do something, but it is to say that in particular situations where a particular state has a particular relationship with another state or non-state actor, it should be exercising uh, what influence it can on a due diligence basis. It doesn't mean that they'll necessarily prevent the bad act from happening, but that they should try uh, to do so. So those are the four draft articles we've got so far and there's commentary associated with them. If you're interested in any of those, again, you go to our 2015 
uh, annual report, look at that chapter seven and that's where you'll find those discussed. The goal now for me is to write a second report. My plan is to submit that in either January or February to the uh, UN Secretariat. So sometime during the spring, that too will pop up on the International Law Commission's website. My current plan is to try to advance about six new draft articles in that report. Um, those are draft articles that will deal with things like an obligation upon states to adopt a national statute on crimes against humanity. Do we really need an obligation of that kind? As it turns out, when you go around and look at the national statutes that exist worldwide, you find that about 50% of the world has no statute on crimes against humanity. You would think that it would be relatively common, but it turns out it's not. Um, and so uh, that's a problem. When you look at even the Rome statute parties, you find that roughly 33 to 40 percent still don't have a national statute on crimes against <laughs> humanity. That may be in part because the Rome statute's not crystal clear in creating an express legal obligation to adopt such a statute. And so apparently at least some states may be thinking to themselves, even as a party to the Rome statute, we don't have an obligation to adopt a national law. Now that means they can't take advantage of complementarity, uh, but that may be the consequence more than, than anything else. So even with Rome statute parties, there seems to be some need to be pushing states to adopt statutes of this kind. Even when you find a state, Rome statute party or not, that has a statute on crimes against humanity, it's also the case that often that definition of crimes against humanity is not the same as what's in Article 7 of the Rome statute. Some of these statutes, national statutes, were adopted in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, long before the Rome statute was drafted. And so you look at the national law and you see that it's much shorter, much less complete than what the Rome Statute says. So again, if you're interested in promoting a relatively robust you know, interstate cooperation and holding offenders accountable and things like that, there's an interest in building these statutes out a bit. And then a further thing is when you look at these statutes, they often are only exercising jurisdiction. They're only allowing for exercise of jurisdiction when crimes against humanity occur in the territory, in your own territory, or when they are committed by your own national. So there's various ways in which jurisdiction isn't being exercised by states, even if they have a statute on crimes against humanity that matches up with Article 7 of the Rome Statute. So this new draft Article 5, I suppose, is going to obligate states to adopt a national law on crimes against humanity, and draft Article 6 would call for states to exercise jurisdiction, not just when the alleged crime is committed in their territory, and not just when the uh, person who allegedly committed the crime is your national, but also in situations where an offender who commits the crime abroad and turns up in your territory, um, there too you're supposed to exercise jurisdiction. I should stress, th this is my current idea for proposals of draft articles, and it will depend on my colleagues at the commission whether they think these are, these are the right kinds of draft articles to develop. So adopting a, a national law that criminalizing it, adopting a national jurisdiction over the offense in a manner that's similar to, say, the Torture Convention or the Enforced Disappearances Convention and so on. Um, I'm also going to be proposing a draft article that will call upon a state in which a situation of crimes against humanity appears to be occurring, calling upon that state to investigate. This is not investigation of a particular person, but investigation of a situation as a whole. Um, you know, creating an expectation, an obligation upon a state where there may be these crimes occurring to do something to investigate them. There would also then be perhaps a draft article on investigating a particular offender 
who turns up in your territory, and that could include an obligation to be sure that person does not leave your jurisdiction uh, if detention is necessary to detain them. Be a draft article on out didere, out judicare, obligation to extradite or prosecute. So offender, alleged offender turns up in your territory, you have to have the national laws allowing you to exercise jurisdiction over them. If another state would like you to extradite, then you have a choice. You can submit the matter to prosecution in your own territory, or you can extradite to another ter another state. And then perhaps a final draft article for the second report on fair treatment of offenders. So throughout the process of detaining, trying, extraditing, treating them properly, which means basically giving them the human rights to which they're entitled uh, under instruments like the ICCPR and, and so on. So those are my current thoughts about a next series of draft articles. We'll then have a third report a year from now that will, I think, uh, hopefully, if I'm reelected, have to give that caveat, we're all up for reelection and who knows, maybe Murphy's gone in a, a year or so, but if I'm reelected, uh, then a third report could address the issue of extradition, how that happens, what the requirements are and how it could go forward and whether there's exceptions or not to an extradition process, as well as mutual legal assistance. One state seeking evidence from another, how does that go forward, what are the obligations, things of that sort. And then from there, it's still an open question, what more might be in this a uh, series of draft articles. I mentioned the possibility of interstate dispute settlement. That's a possibility, and there may be some others uh, as well. In any event, though, the um, possibility is that the commission might finish its work on this project sometime in the period of uh, 2019 to 2020, right? So. There's a little bit of uncertainty because it depends how many reports end up being done, whether the commission is satisfied that the project is, is finished. We do a first reading, then we wait a year or two for a second reading, and if you spin all of that out, then it may not be until 2019, 2020 that this project is done. What happens at that point? Well, at that point, the commission has to decide a couple things. One is it actually would still have to decide do we want to call this a draft convention, right? I mean, we're approaching it, I think, as though it's a draft convention, but that's not a decision that's actually yet been taken by the Commission, and my hope is that that's where we'll end up, but it's going to be a discussion. Um, we produce other kinds of things, right? We produce draft conclusions and draft guidelines and all sorts of stuff. And uh, I think at the end of the day, this should be a draft convention or at least draft articles that could serve as the basis for a convention. But that is an issue that has to be addressed. Second thing we have to do is, is decide what recommendation to make to the General Assembly. Do we recommend that it proceed to, you know, uh, try to turn this into a, a full-blown treaty, you know, maybe through a diplomatic conference, maybe through a negotiation within that legal six committee of the General Assembly, and so on. Um, or do we just say, please take note of this, we think we did a good job, and, uh, you know, we'll just see what happens, right? So a couple decisions have to be made as we send it forward, but whenever it does get to the General Assembly, it is an opportunity then for states to take it up or not. And the hope is that between now and then, as governments are looking at the work of the commission year by year as it goes by, um, gaining some amount of confidence in the work, seeing hopefully the value of the project, ultimately at the end of the day, perhaps they will take it up as a treaty that would be negotiated in some fashion. You know, further changes could be made to the treaty uh, the, the, propose, the proposal of the commission, uh, but ultimately perhaps 90% of it becomes what is finally a, uh, a final uh, treaty. So um, that's pretty much where it is, and um, 
I guess uh, you know I'll just finish by saying that I think um, one way I look at this project is that we had this idea of crimes against humanity emerge during the course of the 20th century. Uh, there was talk about it back at the time of World War I. Not a lot was done then with it. Obviously, in the post-World War II period, the crime sort of comes into its own, being included in the Nuremberg Charter, included in the Tokyo uh, Charter. Persons were prosecuted at Nuremberg for the crime. States individually begin adopting national laws, and some very interesting prosecutions went forward, including in the Netherlands, at the national level in the 1950s, 1960s, and so on. And then, of course, we get the International Cri Criminal Tribunals created in the 1990s, starting with the ICTY, the ICTR, the hybrid tribunals as well, the special tribunals that are out there, and then, of course, culminating in the ICC. I view this project as sort of the next generation for what would be useful to have happen. I think having the emergence of the crime, very important, um, widespread or systematic attacks on the civilian population, this is something we should all care about. Um, having the emergence of national laws in some number of countries, important but incomplete. Having the emergence of the international tribunals where you can try at least some people, right, maybe the most high-level people, is very important. But the next generation, I think, needs to be thinking about putting in place at the national level a more systematic series of national laws and a more systematic way in which states can cooperate with each other in making sure that there's no impunity for these uh, crimes. And so that's how I tend to think about what it is the commission is doing, and I hope at the end of the day it's generally uh, supported, not just within the commission, but within the uh, governmental community and the non-governmental community as well, which is partly why I'm delighted to come to places like the Asher Institute to talk a bit about it, to let people know what's happening, uh, and uh, to uh, also hear thoughts and comments that might be taken into account by me and the commission as we uh, move forward. So I think I will leave it at that, if that's agreeable, and, okay. Thank you so much. For a very uh, exciting lecture where you took us uh, through the work of the International Law Commission and gave us a real intern uh, inside perspective. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Uh, my colleague, Wim, will come to you with the mic uh, when you want to raise or comment or raise an issue, raise a, have a question. It was all crystal clear. So, uh, <laughs> yes, sir. I'm uh, Thomas Verfus, a journalist covering the international courts here in The Hague. Indeed, your comments were crystal clear and most interesting, so I have no question about them. Um, as far as the uh, project on the Convention on Crimes Against Humanity is concerned. That, but I have a question about your introductory remarks. Um, you also mentioned the uh, project of um, codifying customary international law. And I wonder if you could elaborate on the methodology and the uh, result and the status of the result you're hoping to achieve. Is it a draft convention, for example? I ask this because um, here in The Hague we have um, different international courts that also interpret and codify customary international law. Sometimes they come to different conclusions. Um, different panels of the appeals chamber of the same international court may even come to different conclusions when they are, uh, pass judgments in different compositions. Um, so I wonder what happens if the International Law Commission um, comes to conclusions that are different from the conclusions drawn by international courts here in The Hague. I wonder how these conclusions would relate to each other. Yeah, sure. So thank you for that question, and, and yes, let me just highlight that any aspect of the work of the ILC that 
is of interest, I'm happy to, to talk about it even if I didn't mention it in the course of my comments. Um, so the project is identifying customary international law, meaning what are the rules by which a decision maker would be able to determine through a methodology what a customary rule is in a particular situation. So it's not codifying customary international law in the sense of looking at the whole field of international law and codifying customary rules. Instead, it's trying to capture what's the basic methodology that should be employed uh, in identifying the existence of a customary rule in a particular situation. Um, my general impression is that the methodology of at least the leading international courts and tribunals tends to be the same. That is, there seems to be a general acceptance of this idea that we're looking for general practice and we're looking for it in conjunction with opinio juris or acceptance of that practice as law. Um, there's a lot of interesting issues that circulate around that. You know, what's the effect of major multilateral treaties on the development of custom? What's the effect of resolutions of international organizations on the development uh, of custom? Uh, is there a persistent objector rule that's out there and operating? Is there a regional or local custom or even other custom of some kind out there and operating? And so um, I think that the methodology, at least of the major courts and tribunals, in my perception, feel free to correct me, is, is um, relatively well understood, although on the margins there may be some uncertainty. I would say that what is motivating many members of the commission is a sense that we need to help not those courts and tribunals, but more the national courts. Uh, increasingly judges at the national level are confronting issues that require some understanding of customary international law, and yet they may have never taken a course in international law. They may have never really studied this uh, area, and nor their law clerks or the, the litigants appearing before them, and that it would be useful to have a product out of the International Law Commission that is modest in some respects, meaning this will not be a very, very long project. It will have some discrete number of conclusions, less than 20, let's say, um, with relatively straightforward commentary provided with some citations, particularly to international court cases that are helpful in understanding how the source has been treated in particular contexts, something that a, a judge could pick up and within an hour or two read through it and understand the basic rules uh, operating. Um, so I think that it's really more, if there's conflicting methodology happening at the national level, which may well be happening, maybe this will help bring it into some uh, amount of harmony. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's really designed more for that kind of a purpose than to try to deconflict substantive outcomes between, say, an international court of justice and an international criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. We're not trying to resolve that. Uh, we are just trying to see if we can find the basic rules of methodology that do seem commonly employed uh, in international courts and tribunals, by governments, and in the literature as well, as a means of then giving a, a fairly straightforward account for those that are coming to the area uh, without much background. I think there's a gentleman right behind him. Yeah, and then we'll come up to the front. Hi, Will Worcester, Hague University. Um, I'm I'm interested in to what degree this is a this is a codification compared to a progressive development. Um, one of the things about this project that's a bit funny to me is that with the with the with the torture convention and the genocide convention and the Geneva Convention, etc., we have that before we have the Rome Statute. So the Rome Statute copies them. You're copying the Rome Statute, so it's kind of the opposite way around. So when we are interpreting the Rome Statute or we're trying to interpret crimes against humanity, we can look back on those 
In this, it's not as clear. How do, what do you look back towards? Are you looking back towards the Rome Statute and thus the jurisprudence coming out of the ICC? Are you, you, you know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. kind of strange. So then I, I, it makes me wonder, um, how are you going to engage with some of the big issues about crimes against humanity? I'm thinking about the policy requirement. I'm thinking about the issue of, um, of, of immunities for heads of states, et cetera, et cetera. All of these kinds of substantive um, issues. Thank you. Also a wonderful uh, question. Um, so the way I think about it is that probably 95% of our project is going to be borrowing from torture convention, enforced disappearances convention, prior treaties that took a particular kind of offense and said we expect states to do the following. We expect them to adopt a national law criminalizing it, exercising jurisdiction over it, out to dairy, out judicare, all of these things. The difference for our project is we're sticking crimes against humanity. <coughs> Instead of torture by a state official, it's crimes against humanity. Now, that means that I think a large amount of what ultimately will be drafted, and we're only at the early stages, but is going to learn from and benefit from those earlier, I would call them transnational crime type regimes that exist. Even the uh, Convention Against Corruption or Transnational Organized Crime have some, some very interesting things on mutual legal assistance, for example, that might be of relevance to our project. Having said that, you're right that there's a piece of it, specifically the definition of crimes against humanity, that is coming straight out of the Rome Statute. And so there is a bit of a link there. And in my first report and in the commentary of the commission, you'll see that we helped explain what that definition is by reference to ICC jurisprudence, some ICTY and ICTR jurisprudence, and so on, because I think they, they do provide a window on what that definition means. And if you're a national legislature, legislator, and I'm asking you to adopt a national statute that replicates this definition, you're gonna to wanna to know, well, what does it mean exactly? Now, in doing that, in, in giving some explanation as to what it means, the commission did not want to go down a path of taking up complicated, contested issues and trying to resolve them all, right? So you mentioned the policy element you know, our goal was to say there is a policy element here. Here's what some of the tribunals to date have said about that policy element. And we're just gonna, you know, quote from those decisions. Uh, but we're not gonna try to delve into the academic literature where there's a big debate and reach some sort of conclusion. We didn't want to freeze the law in some way. We didn't want to slant the law in a particular way. All we're trying to do is to get you know, the, the national systems relatively on the same page as the international courts in a way that will continue to allow the law to develop over time, but hopefully in some amount of harmony rather than having a lot of different statutes uh, operating. So, you know, my basic feeling is we are looking backwards to earlier treaties that do this kind of stuff, but you're right that there is a, a difference here in that particular bit, the, the definition. And so we've used it, but we're not trying to play around with it at all, yeah. So I think this gentleman here had a question and then we'll come over to you. Uh, thank you. Professor, I'm representing the International Human Rights Commission and my name is Khaled Ahmed Choudhury. I have a question. If there, was, there were uh, crimes against humanity committed during ISAF in Afghanistan and Iraq, and if these incidents have been documented uh, at the ILC, uh, together with the, those who committed these crimes. Thank you. So you may be disappointed to learn that we aren't uh, trying to analyze particular situations. So we're not looking at what's happened in Afghanistan or in Iraq or in Syria or North Korea or you know, any number of countries where there, there may well be claims of, of crimes against humanity. 
we are viewing our project as trying to develop a legal instrument that uh, should be useful and applicable regardless of where these crimes are occurring anywhere in the world. So you will not find anything in the reports I'm doing or in the Commission's annual report that speaks to the issue you're raising. Um, having said that, uh, it's certainly true already that some countries have statutes on crimes against humanity. It's true already that it's possible in different jurisdictions somebody could be arrested and charged with crimes against humanity no matter where it is they were alleged to have done it. The problem is it's just it's a very erratic system right now and we're trying to make it a bit more systematic so that if uh, there's a particular person that is alleged to have committed a crimes against humanity, they hopefully will be in a place where uh, they could be held accountable. And of course, if the case can't be proved against them, then they won't be uh, uh, punished. But if they can be shown to have been someone who committed crimes against humanity, then they would be prosecuted for it. So, yeah. I think here first and then over here. Uh, yeah. Hi, good evening, uh, Jamie Brown, OPCW. Um, first of all, let me just express uh, uh, my admiration for the work that you're doing. I think it's a very important jurisprudential improvement over uh, pre-existing, uh, currently existing international law. So that's it's a uh, superb that you're pushing this forward to the ILC. I like that part of the intervention. Okay. <laughs> uh, might as well start on a positive note. It's crimes against humanity. Anyway, um, uh, I was just, during your um, presentation, you were referring to how um, you were trying to not affect or uh, set aside uh, pre-existing treaties or multilateral conventions in large degree. And this reminded me of something that um, one of your colleagues who's been very instrumental in the development of this convention, uh, Professor Leila Sadat, uh, refers to, in that she says that um, one of the reasons why this convention would be very useful was because of the issues that have emerged from, for example, the Genocide Convention and some of the, the complexities of that convention and the difficulties that states and scholars have with its definition and with its, uh, uh, its practice. Um, and I'm just wondering if you would see this as a, uh, this, this convention, this development as subsuming the Genocide Convention in some degree or if you would see this as uh, a natural progression of some of the ideas contained within it, uh, even though uh, the perspective might be different, uh, it's no longer looking at groups, but rather at individuals. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts are on, on the Genocide Convention and how that would uh, still function if this new convention were to be adopted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I do not think that this project would subsume the Genocide Convention. I think they are dealing with two different types of crimes. Uh, it may well be that the same act being committed is both genocide and crimes against humanity, but they are different crimes and they do have different elements and if you were to prosecute someone for those respective crimes, you'd have to prove two different sets of elements the same way you do before one of the international criminal courts. So I don't see it as, as subsuming it. I think it is learning from aspects of the Genocide Convention. It is building upon some elements. I mentioned this you know, duty to prevent or obligation to prevent idea that is in the Genocide Convention. We do know a bit more about what that means from the ICJ with the Bosnia v. Serbia case. That gives us a bit better understanding of what a obligation to prevent in the context of crimes against humanity means. And so I think it is helpful in that way. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you'll have two different treaties, hopefully, on uh, the two different crimes. Um, and probably fair to say that the Crimes Against Humanity Convention will be a, a better convention just because it's more recent. You know, that you have to go all the way back to 1948 for the Genocide Convention. It was a fairly early instrument of its kind and, and when we've developed other treaties, I mentioned the Torture Convention and Forced Disappearances, clearly they're doing a bit more or, or something a bit different um, and the convention that the Commission hopefully will end up producing will have a fresher feel to it 
um, but I don't think it will directly subsume uh, the genocide convention. I think the two will continue to operate side by side. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Michiel Schoemakers, and I'm a student at Leiden University. Um, so in the beginning, you, you mentioned that the Rome Statute, while, while being very significant, uh, doesn't say anything about the relation between states, in particular on, on MLA. And uh, a few weeks back, I was at the, the ASB of the, the ICC, and I attended a site event on a new initiative, uh, which was organized by, I believe, the Netherlands and, and Belgium, uh, on a new MLA initiative for the domestic prosecution of international crimes. Uh, which also includes uh, crimes against humanity, of course. So my question is, is actually very simple. Like, have you heard of this initiative, and how do you view the, the relation between this initiative and the convention you're mm -hmm. working on? Sure. So um, when we embarked on the project at the ILC, at least I initially wasn't aware of this initiative, but I became aware of it as we went through the process. Uh, it started back, I think, in the fall of 2011, and has been sort of working itself, uh, operating uh, through sort of an initial uh, grouping of, I think, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Slovenia uh, to try get other governments interested in it, and, and that's now grown to a somewhat bigger uh, group. Um, the difference between the two, um, in simplest terms, would be that that project is interested in trying to do more for all three of the atrocity crimes, meaning not just crimes against humanity, but also genocide and also war crimes, serious war crimes, um, and has a particular focus on the extradition mutual legal assistance side of things, that, that the the interest is very much in helping the national prosecutors in doing the kinds of things that they need to do. I think if that initiative can succeed, it's great, right? I, I think it would be wonderful to try to develop something that's going after all of these uh, crimes. When the commission decided to move forward, it thought it best to focus in on the particular area where we have no convention at all which is crimes against humanity, and not try to take up sort of things that would help modernize the Genocide Convention or the 49 Geneva Conventions and so on, that you know, it, that, that it would be less ambitious in that sense, but maybe easier to achieve. Having said that, it also had in mind looking at things beyond just the mutual legal assistance and extradition, so in some respects a broader initiative, you know, if we did do something like interstate dispute settlement, you know, that would be more, I think, than what the, the initiative you're referring to has in mind. So they're not the same initiative. I think they come from the same inspiration, which is at the national level, we need to be doing more. And we need to, in particular, be focusing on interstate cooperation. And... Um, in that sense, they're both completely in harmony, and it's even the case that it's possible that both initiatives could succeed side by side. There may well be some overlap, and that might be a reason why you might have some doubts whether states will want to do both. Uh, but they're directed at somewhat different things. And I think on both sides, the commission and the sponsors of that initiative, there's a desire to let both initiatives try to go forward see how well they're received uh, in the hopes that at least one, if not both, take off. And, um, uh, you know, that's sort of the spirit in which I think it's being approached at the time, at this time. All the way in the back, I think. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is uh, Yad Masoud. I'm a PhD candidate at uh, the University of Paris East. I have a question concerning the relationship between um, state responsibility and individual criminal responsibility for uh, crimes against humanity. How the ICR Commission deals with, the, with it in this uh, project, because as we all know, uh, criminal, individual criminal responsibility is, is dealt with in the Rome Statute, so I was expecting that this convention will deal 
with uh, state responsibility. You have mentioned the, the due diligence obligations, but uh, in, in accordance to the relationship between both responsibility, state and individual criminal responsibility, uh, is it possible, for example, to, to, uh, to establish state res responsibility without criminal, uh, individual criminal responsibility set up? Uh, and uh, how can we move from uh, one responsibility to, to, to another and uh, things like that? Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure. Okay. So first, I guess I would say the Rome Statute deals with international criminal, res criminal responsibility at an international institution, right? It doesn't directly speak to criminal responsibility in national legal systems. So the objective of the Commission's project is to focus on, in particular, issues of prevention and punishment within the national systems, right? So certainly it's going to be speaking to individual criminal responsibility in national systems, and then it's going to have this obligation of prevention, and that obligation does have a relationship to state responsibility issues. So, for example, if your own state organs your army, let's say, goes off and commits crimes against humanity. There's a path here whereby individuals would be prosecuted, either before your own courts or before courts of another country where those offenders turn up. But there's a different path where because it was your own organs that committed these bad acts and you failed to prevent that, there could be state responsibility, right? Now, in the Bosnia v. Serbia context, talking about it with respect to genocide, right, there's the possibility of persons being prosecuted for genocide, both at the ICTY and in national systems, right? So we've got possible individual criminal responsibility, both at the international level and possibly at the national level. We also have the possibility of state responsibility. Now, in that particular case, the court says it wasn't a Serbian organ or a person's under effective control of the government of Serbia. Therefore, no responsibility for directly committing genocide. But the failure to use the influence that they had to stop the Bosnian Serbs did trigger their state responsibility. So no individual criminal responsibility for Serbian government officials because they didn't commit the crimes against humanity, but the failure to prevent, to take steps under due diligence to prevent, did engage state responsibility. And that's what the court found. Now, ultimately, there was no reparation ordered. Uh, in the form of you know compensation or something, but it was a state responsibility type finding. So there's a relationship, um, but it's not necessarily the case that your own uh, army has to commit the, the crime for the state responsibility to be there because the obligation to prevent is broader than that. So in our project, you'll want to look at draft article three on the, um, sorry, draft article four on the obligation to prevent. Look at the commentary and it does talk about the state responsibility aspect with respect to your own organs doing it or the failure to influence others uh, with whom you have a relationship. Uh, yes. Yeah. Also in the very back there. My name is Matthias Neuner, I'm from the STL. Uh, we have just talked about, or you have just talked about the um, obligation to prevent. What about uh, the obligation to suppress slash prosecute? Um, for example, in the Genocide Convention from 48, we have the Article 6, which um, can be interpreted to um, also oblige stage, states to prosecute. Are we thinking in your draft about a similar provision, obliging states in the future to prosecute, not only to prevent uh, breaches, such as crimes against humanity? And will there eventually be a commission, not supervising, but a little bit uh, monitoring, so to speak, um, states' behavior in that regard? 
Thank you. So the answer to the first question is yes. There will be provisions that obligate you to either submit the matter to prosecution or to extradite. Um, if the offender is in your territory, you must take that action. Um, so there will be that obligation. Uh, on the second question, what about some kind of monitoring mechanism? Um, we haven't gotten to that point in the project. Some of my colleagues have said that they are interested in some kind of monitoring mechanism. Uh, the Secretariat of the Commission is currently engaged in a research project to identify different options for monitoring. So it could range from reports by states' parties to uh, some sort of central body could be a committee created like the Committee Against Torture or the Human Rights Committee, uh, could be uh, some other form of process, uh, assembly of states parties coming together regularly to review implementation of the convention. We're going to have our secretariat sort of lay out those different options for us and then hopefully we'll have a good discussion about which, if any of these, is, is a good path for us to go down. I would say a couple things on it. One is, one difference with this project, Crimes Against Humanity, is that often we're talking about aggravated forms of crimes that are addressed in other treaties, right? So take torture, right? You can certainly have torture being occurred on a widespread or systematic basis. That'll be a crime against humanity. But that is going to be within the realm of the Committee Against Torture, too, assuming that you've got the state parties to it uh, lining up and whatnot. So we want to avoid overlap, duplication, and that may be more likely in the context of crimes against humanity because it's a, an aggravated form of all these other things for which we do have some institutions. Uh, having said that, that overlap may not be complete, and there may be things that that need to be filled in. Uh, the other thing I would say on it is, you know, us as a group of legal experts can maybe make some choices in this regard, but it's often a policy decision how to pursue something like a monitoring mechanism. It, you know, do you have the resources to support whatever it is you're talking about? And so, it, you know, we'll see how far we can get in actually making a choice of this kind. Um, one possibility is to set forth options uh, for states to per perhaps pick and choose from, uh, depending on uh, you know where they are in terms of an appropriate uh, mechanism. But I, is think, I think it is something that the commission is going to have to, to think hard about. Yeah. Uh, there's a gentleman two rows up. Yeah. It was the same question. So. Oh, OK. You want me to answer it again? No, OK. <laughs> This gentleman here. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tofen Olsen. I'm a legal advisor at Norwegian Embassy. Uh, thank you for your very precise uh, introduction. I have a question uh, uh, on how your work can engage, let's say, those who are unlikely to sign up to a convention. Um, often, when things are voluntary, people can feel they're letting off the, the hook in a way. So my question is, is it conceivable that you, through your work, would be able to identify what norms uh, may have attained the status of, of customary law and thereby sort of cutting through some of the obstacles that you have mentioned? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Now, it's a great, great question. Um, so as a part of the project, uh, the Commission will be writing commentary to these draft articles. That commentary may well, in certain places, say that something is customary international law. So an example would be, we did clearly state that crimes against humanity is, uh, does not have to occur in connection with an armed conflict, and that is settled international law. Now, that may not be a, a dramatic claim to have made, but it's the kind of thing that, to the extent there was argument about it, now you've got the International Law Commission on record as, as saying as much, and there may be things like that uh, in other parts of the project. Having said that, much of the project is 
um, addressing issues that probably aren't settled customary international law. So, uh, at least in my view, uh, it is not the case that aptidere adjudicare is a settled rule of customary international law across some broad range of crimes. Um, the reason I say that is I think that the, are, there are many countries that don't view it as settled law and some countries that won't do certain things like extradite their own nationals or extradite in the absence of a treaty. And so it's hard, I think, to, for me at least, to, to make a clear finding that that's a rule of customary international law. So when you have things like that, or say that provision on interstate dispute settlement, I don't think you can, you can say there's some customary obligation to go to the ICJ whenever you have a dispute with another state. There's going to be a variety of provisions where we won't be able to do those sorts of things, but others we might. Um, you know, if it ultimately becomes a convention, I, I think then it becomes binding law on whoever joins it. But if it doesn't become a convention, then there just may be bits and pieces of it that are helpful in identifying areas of settled law, or maybe at least providing a model for states on a regional or bilateral basis to enter into treaty instruments, or perhaps just provide inspiration in other paths uh, that might be pursued. So uh, I have ambitious hopes, but if it doesn't go that direction, there may at least be some uh, value. And even if it becomes a treaty, I think the spirit of your question was, well, for states that don't join the treaty, what does it say to them? I think it will be, um, you know, parts of it will and parts of it won't. Maybe take the last two and at, at the same time. And I have a, a oh. follow-up question sure. uh, on this one. Abuse my uh, <laughs> position as a chair just for a small follow-up question because you mentioned the possibility of interstate dispute settlement and uh, being in the city of the ICJ, I was wondering whether you could explore uh, that uh, a bit bit more. Uh, mm -hmm. Give uh, give you our, um, give us your thoughts on. What, what you think of when you mention that in this context. Sure, so um, we do have um, dispute settlement clauses in a number of these treaties that deal with these types of crimes. I've mentioned the Torture Convention. It has a dispute settlement clause that calls for ICJ jurisdiction, and we saw that in the Belgium v. Senegal case. <coughs> mentioned the Genocide Convention. That has a dispute settlement clause, Bosnia v. Serbia. Croatia v. Serbia. Um, when you look at those clauses across different treaties, you see a few different elements in them, and I would say that there's roughly four. One is an obligation upon states to negotiate any disputes they have with respect to the interpretation or application of the <coughs> treaty. Second, uh, in the event that they are unable to resolve the matter through negotiation, an obligation to go to arbitration. Third, if a state is unable or unwilling to, not unable, but unwilling to go to arbitration, an ability to go to the International Court of Justice. And then fourth, um, the uh, ability of states to opt out of the system. And, you know, I think that fourth one is the, the maybe the trickiest or most interesting, right? You have to make a choice about whether this is a compulsory dispute settlement process for which all state parties will be bound. That's great in terms of making a firm obligation to go to dispute settlement, but obviously it may make it very difficult for some states to join. So maybe it's better to allow an opt-out, but force the state to opt-out. So they're going to be in the system. If they join the treaty, they have to take an affirmative decision at the time of ratification or accession to opt-out. So that's the way many of these treaties are written. I have not drafted anything on this. Uh, I haven't really talked with members of the commission about it. Um, but I think that's a possible path to go, and it certainly would be consistent with other trees of this type that are out there. Yeah. So I saw at least two more hands. We maybe could take both of them. Sure. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Jimena. I'm from the ICC. Um, my question is about um, the autetere adjudicare uh, that you have been mentioning. And uh, indeed, um, many countries have a restriction to extradite their own nationals. And I mean, it's very based on bilateralism. And so um, I was wondering if you have any concrete um, proposals that you would incorporate into this treaty as to how to uh, sort of circumvent that or how would you try to incorporate this in the treaty and if this would go along into the possibility of allowing uh, for reservations um, in general or in part. Um, thank you. Yeah, so um, you know, the, the, the normal Autodere Autodere clause, including as it was presented in the Convention Against Torture and interpreted by the court in the Belgium v. Senegal case, um, basically says you have an obligation to submit the matter to prosecution in your country. You can relieve yourself of that obligation if you extradite to another country that's willing to submit the matter to prosecution. So states that don't want to extradite their own nationals have a path under an Autodere Autodere clause of that kind, the path is, if you don't want to extradite your national, submit it to prosecution. And so, you know, depending on the formula we choose, if it's like that, one answer at least to the state that doesn't want to extradite its nationals is to say, well, you don't have to do it, um, but you're going to have to then submit it to prosecution in your own uh, state. Uh, if the provision is written differently in some way that in some fashion would compel extradition, then I think we squarely confront the issue you're talking about. But I think we may be able to avoid it if we, if we go the first route I mentioned. Um, the issue of reservations is, is a very important one. Um, many of these treaties before uh, torture Convention enforces disappearances do allow reservations, but then we've got the Rome Statute, which does not allow reservations, and we probably have a relatively strong sentiment in many quarters today that worries about reservations, about a state somehow you know watering down significantly its obligations under a treaty. So this is a discussion that I think the Commission will have to have. Uh, do we have a no reservations clause? Do we have a clause that says no reservations except, and that's sort of the spirit in which you raise it, except for you don't have to extradite your nationals? Are we silent on the matter, which then effectively allows reservations, and that helps bring states into the regime, but we worry about will they fully accept the obligations? Uh, we haven't reached any decisions on that at the Commission, and I think it will turn a lot on what are the exact obligations. Um, because if they're relatively modest, relatively straightforward, I think it makes it easier to do a no reservations clause. If it's very elaborate and has a lot of things to it that will run into trouble with different states, perhaps running afoul of their constitution, then you've got an argument for at least allowing some uh, reservations. So it's, it's an important issue that we'll confront in due course. Yeah, right here in the front, uh, there's a question, thanks. Thank you so much for presentation. My name is Yulia Badrov, I'm from ICC2. Um, I was wondering about enforcement mechanism on a vertical level or uh, relation, interrelation maybe with ICC or how would you see um, enforcement mechanisms uh, um, of the convention with national level and international. So you, we already mentioned that there should be uh, alternative institution to watch what's happening, but do you see uh, Security Council taking part of this or ICC referrals or mm -hmm. how would you how would you see that uh, internationally? Yeah, no, it's a very, very interesting and important uh, question. So I think um, the members of the Commission uh, among themselves have been quite clear from the start that nothing should be done in our project again, hopefully that becomes a convention 
that in any fashion conflicts with the Rome Statute. And that means in part, if the ICC requests uh, an individual to be surrendered to it, and the state party to the Rome Statute therefore has an obligation to surrender, and if that state party also has an obligation under our convention to extradite or prosecute, the obligation under the Rome Statute wins, right? It needs to be the superior obligation. So we need to be able to write our treaty to make it quite clear if another state under our treaty seeks extradition, but the ICC seeks surrender, you surrender to the ICC. Now again, I'm talking about this, the parties to the Rome Statute, the ones that have that obligation to uh, surrender to the ICC, they need to be able to uh, honor that obligation even if our treaty enters into force later at time. So we will need to write our convention to make that quite clear. Um, beyond that, in terms of enforcement, I think the general idea is just that there may be enforcement at the international level, there may be at the national level. If there's a conflict between obligations, the international level wins. Um, if the Security Council jumps into this, who knows uh, what happens exactly, right? Uh, it's obviously got a certain role under the Rome Statute. It also has a separate role as simply being the Security Council. It can issue decisions that have the effect under Article 103 of the Charter to supersede treaty obligations. So it might alter something that's happening under the Commission's convention, I suppose, in some theoretical sense. Um, but I don't know as we would try to take account of that in any fashion in our treaty. So in the same way that the Torture Convention or the Enforced Disappearances Convention says nothing about the Security Council, I would predict that our convention will also say nothing about uh, the Security Council. Okay. No more hands waving. No more questions. Then I'd like to thank you uh, for your excellent questions and comments. And, uh, and Sean, thank you so much My for pleasure. your presentation really and for uh, being willing to discuss um, the draft articles um, with us. Um, <laughs> as you know, as I mentioned, this is the final uh, lecture in this series of this year. But of course, we hope to be back with, and uh, we will be back with uh, more lectures next year. So please keep uh, being informed, either through visiting our website or through uh, uh, registering with our um, email uh, lists. Um, uh, Professor Murphy was, uh, has accepted our invitations to record the, the, the lecture and it will be uh, posted on our website, so uh, please visit the uh, internationalcrimesdatabase.org website uh, for this lecture or other lectures that have been recorded and posted there. So again, thank you so much. And, uh, thank we'll you.